Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first scripture reading is uh, 2 Corinthians verses, uh, chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light, what can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with the unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out with them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. This morning's second scripture reading is from the Old Testament, from the book of 2 Samuel. From chapter 20, I'll be reading the first two verses, and then verses 14 through 22. And if you're using a red church Bible, that can be found on page 315. Again, 2 Samuel chapter 20, the first two verses, and then verses 14 through 22. Now a troublemaker named Sheba, son of Bakri, a Benjamite, happened to be there. He sounded the trumpet and shouted, we have no share in David, no part in Jesse's son. Every man to his tent, Israel. So all the men of Israel deserted David to follow Sheba, son of Bichri. But the men of Judah stayed by their king all the way from Jordan to Jerusalem. Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel Beth. Mehaka, and through the entire region of Bichrites, who gathered together and followed him. All the troops with Joab came and besieged Seba in Abel Beth Mehaka. They built a siege ramp up to the city, and it stood against the other fortifications. While they were battering the wall to bring it down, a wise woman called from the city, listen, listen. Tell Joab to come here so I can speak to him. He went toward her and she asked him, Are you Joab? I am, he answered. She said, Listen to what your servant has to say. I'm listening, he said. She continued, Long ago they used to say, Get your answer at Abel, and that settled it. We are the peaceful and faithful in Israel. You are trying to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why do you want to swallow up the Lord's inheritance? Far be it from me, Joab replied. Far be it from me to swallow up or destroy. That is not the case. A man named Sheba, son of Bichri, from the hill country of Ephraim has lifted up his hand against the king, against David. Hand over this one man and I'll withdraw from the city. The woman said to Joab, his head will be thrown to you from the wall. Then the woman, the woman I'm sorry, went to all the people with her wise advice and they cut off the head of Sheba son of Bichri, and threw it to Joab. So he sounded the trumpet, and his men dispersed from the city, each returning to his home. And Joab went back to the king in Jerusalem. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. And I'd like to welcome Chris with us again. It's been a couple of years, yes. but welcome back. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you would all oblige me, I love to pray just before I preach. I know we've prayed several times, but I just sense his power more when I concentrate on what he's doing more than my papers or more than what he's already put in my head. 
I just want to completely yield to his power. So if you would pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for the power that you give your people. Power to hear, power to obey, power to walk forward in all the things that you have for each one of us. The power to realize that we're forgiven. The power to realize we've been restored because of your unfailing love. Father, we thank you for the wisdom you give your people. Sometimes we don't feel very wise. Sometimes we feel that we've made terrible decisions. But we know that power resides within each one of your children because your word says so. So, Lord, we yield to you. Lord, I hide behind Christ. And I pray, Lord, that his power would speak through me and that you would be seen and you would be glorified through this word of yours. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I titled this, It Just Takes One. You know, in Proverbs 29, it says, A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. In verse 1, where it says, a worthless fellow happened to be there. This guy, Sheba, he's a Benjamite. He blew that trumpet. The trumpet was a sound for people to pay attention. Now we can text each other, call someone. But back then, the trumpet was a major tool used to get people's attention so that they would listen to the one that was proclaiming whatever he had to say. And what he had to say was they had no portion with David. They had no connection. So he just basically starting his own way. And all the men of Israel withdrew. They followed David. It's funny how people will quickly forget the things that happened prior and hear this trumpet call, hear this announcing thing that just happens, and then all of a sudden, let's go off and do this now and follow this other way. We quickly turn from where we forgot where the blessings came from. That word worthless in verse 1, worthless fellow, it truly means a good for nothing, an unprofitable, a wicked person. You know, a lot of times we think of sinners. We're all sinners. We're saved by the grace of God, and God has made us holy, blameless, pure, clean, all the other adjectives that the Bible says about who we are as Christians. But because, as was mentioned, because that Adam fell, we all fell also. We followed in that sin and that rebellion. You look at a small child. No one taught them to be rebellious, but they are because that's who we are. But God, in his mercy and kindness, and that's what I cling to, the but gods all through scripture, but God, in his faithfulness, he has made provision. We have no portion in David. One man said that section of verse 1, he certainly had a grudge against David for wanting the removal of the kingdom out of the tribe of Judah, because that's David's tribe. We of Israel, this guy Sheba's thinking, we of the ten tribes are under no obligation to the house of David. Basically, that trumpet call was to leave him. Leave him and let's go do our own thing. Let every man fall into the ranks under his own leader. Do you know that just appeals to the flesh? And as was mentioned earlier, our country is in a mess because the rule of law and order has just been wiped away and everybody wants to have their own little thing, their own decisions, their own way, and it just leads to chaos, as we've seen in our country. Who wants an overarching, an overreaching government? People naturally want to do their own lo local thing. They want to be left alone. Nobody likes to be told what to do. By nature, we loathe being told what to do. We cannot stand it. But you know the laws we have in this country and the scripture, the laws to love the Lord your God, the greatest commandment? Oh, I got to do that? No, you'll, if you know who Jesus Christ is, you'll want to love the Lord your God. You'll be compelled. You can't help 
but love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself, the two greatest commandments. You'll be excited and have such a passion to love God once you realize what he's done, once you realize who he is. When we see and experience the holiness of who God is, we will truly fear the Lord, not like this in paranoia, because we know that God that is holy and powerful sent his only son. And that only son has died. Even if we were the only ones on this planet, he would have sent his son. And that's the blessing we have of the intimacy of God's desire for each one of us to walk so close, to realize daily he is cupping our face, trying to bring attention to himself. The Lord himself does not blow a trumpet to gather attention to himself. He speaks to us in a still small voice. He speaks to us through the word of God. He speaks to us through the, the unction and the power of the spirit moving within our souls, speaking his unfailing love and his commitment to each one of us. Why would we want to rebel against that? Because Satan's terrific job is to be a distraction to cause us to look somewhere else other than to look up. That's his job. So Satan does appeal to the flesh. And that's why we rebel sometimes when the Lord is telling us through a brother, through the word, through the spirit speaking to us, our spirit rebels because the flesh, the sin nature within us is trying to argue and justify how we feel our position, how we think it should go, like we have a better idea than God. Come on, it's never going to happen. Never. So, this wicked man, a lawless, yokeless, you know, they yoked animals in farming in the Old Testament. And if you see Amish country, they still don't use me mechanized equipment. They yoke animals because two are more powerful than one. Two actually helps the rows go straight when the plow is digging. There's a reason why these things are yoked together. And God uses those principles in teaching spiritual truths about being unevenly yoked. This man had no yoking. He just wanted to be left alone to his own devices, to his own way. And he wanted, of course, everyone to come with him. Because what's that expression? If you're miserable, misery loves company. They want a lot of people around them so they can feel good while they're miserable. <laughs> So this yokeless man, he cast off the yoke of law, which was following the kings, first Saul and then David. So he had no yoke, no desire to walk this way. When it says a Benjamite, nothing is known of this man, Sheba, except these few passages in Scripture. But being a Benjamite, probably belonging to the family of Saul, King Saul before David was a Benjamite. He seems to have had a considerable influence in Israel to raise such an insurrection. I mean, if somebody was screaming on the street corner to come follow them, and you left this building, you'd be like, who's that? Unless you personally knew him, or you knew he was like a mayor or a governor of an area, then you might go listen to what he has to say. He perhaps had been in the rebellion of Absalom. If you know the Old Testament a little bit, you know that one of David's sons, Absalom, led a rebellion against his own father and tried to take the kingdom to himself because of issues that Absalom had with his brother. Quite a story going on in 2 Samuel and 1 Samuel. It's very interesting reading if you ever have the opportunity. But you can see all the troubles that David went through with his children. And many of it was because he sinned originally, and it caused all this trouble and destruction. Note this, sin always causes destruction and problems in our lives. Yes, there is redemption. Yes, there is forgiveness, but it does cause destruction, even if it's in our minds. Unnecessary guilt, unnecessary worry, unnecessary fill in the blank. Sin causes these things. So it says when he blew the trumpet, as they said, it means basically pay attention to me. We're going to gather our own political party, it would say nowadays, if we were living today and this would have happened. This guy formed his own party. He wanted the attention drawn to himself. 
It just takes one. You know, David had worked so hard. Oh my gosh, if you read the portions before here, how he was told, you will be the king. And David's saying, I'm just a teenager, I, an early 20-something. I, who, who am I? I'm from the least family. My tribe is the least, tri you know, like he just, he felt like he didn't like, what are you, what is this prophet Samuel telling me? Anyway, time comes to pass and Saul is jealous of David. And Saul is trying to eliminate him. Constantly, an evil spirit comes into Saul and he tries to pin him against the wall with a spear. He goes after him several times trying to hunt him down to destroy him. Because Saul is jealous that the people liked David better. David had two opportunities, the scripture records, once in a field and once in a cave, to kill Saul. Even his men said, kill him. The prophet said, you're going to be king. This is your chance. David took the word of God as more valuable. I will not touch the Lord. I will not kill the Lord's anointed. David knew God put Saul there. David knew that. And David refused to be the one to kill him. God saw to it that a stranger destroyed Saul, not David. David had clean hands. Several other times, things terrible happened, and David allowed the events to play out. It sounds like weakness to the flesh, but David's steadfastness with God showed that he trusted God more than what the eyes see. Because we know our eyes and our ears, they deceive. They deceive us. It just takes one to turn things around. It took a long time, as I said, to join all these tribes together, the 12 tribes of Israel. They were all over the place, and they had, obviously, their own little law and order in their own places. God had set Moses and set them all up, and Joshua, and they had taken over the promised land, spread out over thousands of miles. David brought them together, not by killing Saul, but by doing honorably, listening to the Lord. And God brought the tribes together, using David as a man after his own heart, as an example. As was said earlier, it's amazing. These people, they read my message. They did. Because the example of people that walk with God spread out to the community, and people loved David because of it. They recognized he was of God. David sought the Lord for constant guidance, and God's guidance caused David to save, to say and make good decisions that the people of Saul's tribe, because you figure they would be jealous. The tribe, it's, the kingship's going to go to another tribe. That's such an embarrassment and such a disappointment. But they actually wanted him to take over. And when Sheba says in verse 1, we have no portion in David, Sheba interpreted what the men of Judah said in the previous chapter when Judah was ushering David back over the bridge because Absalom had run him right out of the kingdom. He was going after him. Now Absalom was dead, and they're bringing David back as the king. Well, Israel was bringing him back, and Judah, all the tribes. Well, of course, you know how that goes. People get jealous of one another. The, the flesh again, the flesh. And Judah k claimed kindred to David. Yes, but he's of our tribe. And then Israel tribes went, oh, they just were cut down right there. But again, it's just people. It's not what da David didn't say this. The rest of the Israelites had no interest in him. Thus, they, who just before in the last chapter, they just said this. In the last chapter, they said they had ten parts in David. In other words, they were united behind this guy because they saw how honorable David was. And then in the very next chapter, whatever that length of time was, they're ready to follow the Sheba guy like that. Here now David and his tribe of Judah were the only ones together. Just one tribe. It just takes one. King David had his army set out to get the troublemaker, knowing Sheba would cause great dissension in the rest of the kingdom. And these are verses 3 through 13 that we didn't cover, but just to make a connection, I'm just going to give you the brief uh, overview. They know that Sheba was going to cause the trouble, cause a lot of dissension and trouble. 
Joab, the army commander, though loyal to David, decides himself to kill one of the army commanders, Amasa, that David had told you go and lead. And the reason why David did that, if you looked at the history, this Amasa was loyal to David. Joab actually went with King Absalom. So here's this guy that was so loyal to David. When David left and ran away, Joab says, okay, I'm going to be loyal to, to Absalom. What kind of loyalty is that when you can change like that? He didn't go off with David. He stayed with Absalom. So David recognized that and he said, Amasa, this other army commander, has been loyal to me. So he sent Amasa out. Amasa, probably a young person, maybe inexperienced, maybe, maybe not, doesn't say. But the point was he was taking too long. Joab realized what was going on and he went after Sheba also. And of course, people saw Joab's success all through First and Second Samuel, well, Second Samuel especially, how so much had been done under Joab. So they, a lot of the warriors followed Joab, and then Joab saw Amasa as a threat to his position as the army leader because it was competitive in Joab's head. Or possibly that Joab also doubted Amasa's commitment to David. So now we're back at verses 13 at the end of B going into 14. They started pursuing Sheba, the son of Bichri. He went through all the tribes of Israel, Abel, Beth Mecca, and to all the Berites. And they were gathered together and all went after him. So they were of one mind, knowing they've got to get this guy. They came and besieged him in Abel Beth Mecca. And they cast up a siege ramp against the city and stood by it in the rampart. You ever see those old movies where they built earth and they pushed earth right against the wall so they didn't have to try to, remember, they didn't have cannons and those types of things. So they'd build up the earth so that they could just like bridge and march right over the wall and destroy the city. A wise woman. It just takes one. One wise woman. Watch this. She calls out to Job, come here that I may speak with you. Basically, tell your general. She didn't know who, she, who was like there, but she said, tell your general, I desire to speak with him, which was wisely done. To have nothing to say but to the general itself, the guy that's in charge. The word wise means skillful in technical work and war, having wisdom in administration, wise ethically and religiously. She had a shrewdness, a subtle way about her. See, someone can be very smart. And this is something at my older age, I hate to say old age because I'm not old yet, but I'm getting older. At my older age, people can be very wise, very smart, but they can be arrogant. And once someone speaks arrogance, it destroys the wisdom. If you've noticed that, very smart people, when they become arrogant, their communication has now been cut because now their audience is not listening because the arrogance blocks the wisdom from coming through. This woman, it's, like, it's almost like she had it all together. She was wise, but she knew how to speak, how to administer, and how to arrange this whole thing. This is true wisdom. As God gave the judges rule over Israel to lead with God wisdom, back in the book of Judges, this woman was probably like a governor of the city. The appeal of this woman was like Deborah that led Israel over the Canaanite oppressors with great victory in Judges chapters 4 and 5. She was a strong leader, but not an arrogant one. If you read the Judges, Deborah was amazing. She told the leader, God has said he's going to give you victory, go, and then he didn't want to go. You come with me. Very well, I'll go with you. But like, she didn't desire to get the credit. She wasn't trying to stand above everyone else. She received from God and she gave it to the leader and the leader didn't want to go. Similar is this woman. The wise woman refers to this and says to Joab that he should have proceeded this way. In other words, if you're truly a wise leader, don't just try to wreck a whole city. What are you doing? Find out who we are investigate. It's like when two people argue and they don't even know what they're arguing about. It's that kind of thing without finding out why they're arguing. 
So going around like a bull, and this is what, in my head, this is what I, it looked like to me, going around like a bull in a china dish shop. Can you imagine the bull in the china dish shop, turning around, smashing all the dishes, knocking all the plates off the wall, ruining the entire store, and not knowing what the bull is doing, because it's just an animal not being led. It just smashes and ruins everything. This is what Job was doing to this city. Verse 17, it says, He approached her, and the woman said, Are you Job? Yes, I am. She said to him, Listen to the words of your maidservant. You know what she didn't say? Job, you're an idiot. She didn't say that. She didn't come out with arrogance. She didn't say, Why don't you come talk to us first? Boy, that's really dumb. No, she didn't insult him. Listen to the words of your maidservant. Approaching him in humility, recognizing he's a leader of the army, recognizing his position and respecting it. She had the wisdom, she had the key, but she didn't try to bang him over the head with it. She went into the door lock right where it belonged and turned the knob. And the tumblers all turned the way they're supposed to when you use the right key. And the door opens without breaking it. He answered, I am listening. He had to recognize, remember, this man is like a loose cannon. She's not just trying to butter him up, but using wise words to get Joab to listen to her. Because she, in her, in her mind, some of the commentators said, though she was a woman, and in these days, women were like, who are you? Who's the leader? And if she were to say, I am, no, who's really the leader? Because that's the way these people thought in these days. Come and check and hear what I have to say, she said. It's almost like the picture of the woman that met with Jesus. And she begged for help. And he said, I still cringe when he said these words, because if this was said today, he would be labeled some kind of an awful person. I have come for the children of Israel. I am not going to give their food to the dogs. He called the woman a dog. Jesus Christ called this woman a dog. What an insult. And then she said, what'd you call me a dog for? No. She said, but even the dogs get the scraps from the master's table. She wanted a blessing from Christ. And she walked in humility because she wanted that blessing. She knew who he was and she wanted it more than anything else. And then immediately, of course, God knows everything. He knew this whole thing was going to happen beforehand. He said something to the effect, your faith has served you well. Go in peace. What you ask has been done. It's been done. Walking in humility, going after God, we will hit stone walls. We will hit obstacles. But if we keep pursuing Christ in all humility, with all desire to not let the distractions stop us, Christ will give us the desires of our heart if it's truly Christ that we seek. This wise woman knows how to talk to people to get good results. Obviously, being a leader, she rose to the power of leader for a good reason. Even the men of the city went to her for sound wisdom and judgment. Verse 18, she spoke saying, formerly they used to say, they will surely ask advice at Abel, and the dispute would end. What does that mean? You read that today, and we're like, I'm not sure what that means. Well, this city, Abel, was probably famed for the wisdom of its inhabitants. Remember, if she's the leader, and she is imparting her wisdom to the people that live there, they all become a mirror image of that wisdom, that humility, that sound judgment that goes on in the leader. If we follow Christ, if we walk with God, if we seek his face, we will have the power within us. We have it anyway, but we will be recognized that we have this power. We will be seen by others, not trying to make a name for ourselves, just walking. Just walking, just going to work, just loving our wives, our children, our parents, grandparents, and our, our neighbors. Just living life, not trying to work hard, trying to go crazy just walking with God, it will be recognized because if he is the perfect leader, who he is, and we are his loyal subjects, it's going to flow right through us. 
It's going to because God is faithful. He desires to make his name great in this world through his children. I am of those, in verse 19, who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You are seeking to destroy this city. Even a mother in Israel, why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? That city was a true mother. What is a mother? They raise their child. What does a mother do? Stop the child from going into the street to getting run over by a cement mixer. What does a mother do? Feel ch feed children proper fruits and vegetables and not just give them ice cream. <laughs> they nurture their children with words. If they say something that the parents don't approve of, stop that, don't do that, say this. You know, I, I thought about my daughter when she's trying to teach the kids to say or, or no, or you know, she's trying to tell them no, because what do most parents do? No, 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 no. After a while, what does the kid learn? No, 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 no. So they imitate what the parents are doing. And I admire my daughter, she says all the time, no, no, thank you, no, thank you. Like when they go to stand on the chair, no, no, thank you. So she's teaching them no, but it's with the words thank you after. They don't understand what thank you means, but it helps my daughter, I know, I see it. It helps her tone instead of no, it's no thank you, no thank you, no thank you. So it helps her tone, the kids see it, and again, they reflect it. We are all products of our environment. It's, 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 we can't help it, that's who we are. And we become products of what we fill our minds and our heart and our ears with. I am for peace, it says in verse 19, in the second part. Not contention of any kind. I am faithful. I adhere to David. I neither seek nor shall sanction any rebellion or anarchy in the land. So Job heard that. And in verse 20, he said, Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. You know, Job, as I said, he was a loose cannon. He wiped people out just because they represented a threat or because he made a judgment call ahead of what David wanted to do. He would say to David, let's just wipe him out. It's like, who are you? It's like, I'm the one that goes to God. You're certainly not doing that right now, talking like that. So he was a very loose cannon, but he had a loyalty and a passion for the kingdom of Israel. And he didn't want to see things fall apart. So kind of like a mini Peter in the New Testament. Lord, I'll never deny you, and, you know, and always following, having a heart and a passion for Christ. But sometimes Peter was a loose cannon and got himself into trouble. Job continues in verse 21, Such is not the case, but a man, and he explains the whole problem, that this guy Sheba has come down, lifted up his hand against King David, hand him over, I will depart the city. And the woman knew that this guy, very simple, very plain, wants to stop this insurrection. So he says, I'll get his head for you. We'll throw it over the wall. Verse 22, the woman wisely, they use this word again, wisely. Again, she wisely talks to get Job's attention. She uses wise words in approaching Job, in speaking with him. And now she wisely came to all the people. Do you see this woman's mode of operation? It's not like she made a mistake and said something good. It's like, wow, I got away with that one. It's who she was. It's her lifestyle. She walked in wisdom. They cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, threw it over to Job. Job blew the trumpet. Again, they didn't have cell phones. They were dispersed from the city, each to his tent. Joab returned to the king. Sheba is delivered to Joab. Sheba's rebellion ends suddenly. Because in these days, and, in, and even today, once you remove the leader, usually the people under them, they squawk for a while, then they dissipate and separate. Not all the time, but most times. Note this, Job had murdered Amasa and seized upon the supreme command of the army, and such was his power at present. He's in charge now. And the service which he had rendered to the state, being zealous for the kingdom, he quelled the rebellion of Sheba. So he got a desired end, but he did it the wrong way getting there. And if you read later on, when Solomon, David's son, took over, David told Solomon, deal with Sheba, uh, deal with, um, oh, what's his Joab. name? <laughs> deal with Joab. 
I got my finger right on it so I wouldn't lose my place and I just I, I drew a blur. Deal with Joab because he killed innocent blood. And David knew that had to be dealt with. But David was worried about civil war because many of the people, and David cared, not worrying about himself, David cared for the people of Israel to be united to God. And that would just would have been one more distraction causing much more trouble. So David kept him as the leader. Side note, I said Job does get dealt with. This story, as graphic as it was, it starts out with one worthless fellow and it ends with one wise woman. It just takes one. It takes one to make things go right and it takes one to ruin everything. As the first Adam sinned, bringing trouble and grief and sin and sorrow into the world, the second Adam Jesus Christ, the God-man, that one died and that all who believe in him would be saved. Because of one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, we are made righteous, clean, and holy. It just took that one. It just took Jesus. It didn't take 50 angels. It took one God-man. Considering the beginning of this portion, there's a uh, commentator I've really come to like, his look on things. His name is David Guzik. He said the principles behind Sheba's or anyone's rebellion is three things. There's three things that lead to a rebellion. And you look at our country with all the rioting and all the terrible things. Three things. Because when I said this, this guy wrote this 200 years ago. I don't know when this guy wrote this. But three things bring a rebellion to a people. It's denial of the king's sovereignty. Sheba denied David's kingship over Israel. Spiritually, unbelievers deny lordship of Jesus Christ over them or anyone else. It's denial of lordship. Number two, devaluation of who the king is. Sheba said, every man to his own tent. We have no portion in David. Almost like when you shoo a fly. This guy's the king. Uh, he's nothing. The unbeliever. God. The Christians are like, he's my everything. He's my redeemer. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. The third thing, and it's the result of those first two, it's the decision to go your own way. Sheba blew the trumpet, drew people to go their own way. The unbelievers go their own way to their destruction. The people of Abel killed Sheba and gave his head to Job. They were wise in not tolerating the rebel in their midst. They were wise in sparing their city the ravages of a siege. You know, if you look at the end of Israel and Judah, you know what the incoming armies that God sent? Yeah, God sent them to destroy his own people because he knew they were so wicked that some would escape and repent, but he had to teach them a lesson. They built these siege ramps. Like I said, they moved the earth and they marched right in and just tore everything apart. They lots of times, a lot of times, they cut off the water supply to make the people thirst to death. And they couldn't leave the city to farm and to get animals and starved them to death. So this wise woman, you know, you think, I picture the Monopoly board. You can have all the money in the Monopoly game, but if you don't have deeded property, you're just going to run out of money and you're going to lose. <laughs> you're going to lose if you don't have any deeded property. So likewise, if you don't have a city that's vibrant, if you don't have a family that's vibrant, if you don't have an individual soul and a spirit that's vibrant, you will become bankrupt. You will starve and thirst to death without the life-giving work of Christ and His Spirit in your life. Because with Him, you can fall, as a dear sister shared, that she had an issue and she wanted our prayer. She knew the source of all power. That's a wise woman that recognized she needs the prayers of the saints. She knows the power of God. She's experienced it and tasted it, just like each one of us have in our lives, have experienced the rescue, the forgiveness, the faithfulness, the love 
that is unending and forever. In 2 Corinthians, that portion I had you read, it has to be talking about being bound. And it's the same thing that's going on. If you're a Christian, why are you connecting? Not just connecting. We work in this world. We have family members that are unsaved. But when we become yoked with them. We become so consumed with their way of life. It's trouble. And that's why Paul told these Corinthians, don't become yoked with these unbelievers. You work amongst them, but don't go into business with them. Don't marry them for God's sake. Because you will have to compromise everything you stand for. You'll want to pray. They won't care. You'll want to repent. They'll say, what's the matter with you? You'll have a constant thorn in your side. And that's why Paul pleaded with them. Do not be bound with these unbelievers. Because he would see a Sheba, son of Bichri, blowing a trumpet in their lives to tear them away. From the sovereignty of God. You know when it says in the end of that portion in 2 Corinthians. I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me. In that portion in 2 Corinthians. That is family. That is a connected unit of people. That is a church body. Each family member is unique. We sometimes talk about our family members. Oh that one. Oh my gosh. When they come over. Oh. You know, it's like, but they're still family. Someone tries to say something against that family, you're going to stick up as much as you find your quirky family sometimes quirky because they're family. Paul's speaking, over, over, sorry, Paul is speaking to the overly broad affections of the Corinthian Christians. They had joined themselves to unbelievers, affecting their reconciliation with Paul. He's the one that start, started them off and led them to Christ. The idea of don't, don't be unequally yoked is based on Deuteronomy 22.9. It speaks of joining two things that should not be joined together. That's what it is. King David was a true son of God and likewise God, a true father to him. That family connection. Several Psalms talking about st staying away from the wicked and delighting yourself in God. It says delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. That's 37, 4. 12 and 13, the wicked plots against the righteous like Sheba, gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs because the Lord is above it and is able to quell that problem. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. That woman, Jesus Christ, all those that walk with God utter wisdom. Remember Sheba's problem, denial of the king, devaluation of the king and decision to go your own way. David did the opposite. He valued God. David valued God positioned. David followed the instructions. Other than the Bathsheba thing, which was a wreck with Uriah, it's almost like if you could take that part of his life and throw it out, every other part of David's life, he's just a representation of what we're capable of. We have the ability to walk with God with our whole heart, but have mistakes and fall. But David realized his error, and he knew he sinned when Nathan, Nathan the prophet came and waved his rubber finger in my vernacular and told him off saying, what have you done? And David didn't fight with Nathan like some of the other kings fought with prophets. He said, I have sinned. And that's the conviction when you know who God is and you value his position. Matthew Henry, in closing, said, a discreet woman, by her prudent management, satisfied Job and saved a city. Wisdom is not confined to rank or sex. It consists not in deep knowledge. As I said, very smart people can be very arrogant. But it's understanding how to act as matters rise and troubles may be turned away and benefits secured. Think about this. A great deal of mischief would have been prevented if the contending parties would understand one another. If Joab didn't try to start destroying the city and if he desired to speak to the one in charge, a lot of this trouble wouldn't have even happened. Perhaps. The single condition of peace is the surrender of the traitor. Now we're thinking of this story. 
But spiritually, you know the traitor is in our life? It's the flesh. This is our traitor. Because this tells us, don't listen to God when God tells us to follow me. This is a traitor. Our flesh, our thinking, our will. That ugly part of us that wars with God. That's the traitor. Because God has life. God brings hope. God brings love. And the traitor says, no, 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 I got a better way. In so, it is so in God's dealing with the soul, when besieged by conviction and distress, sin is the traitor. Beloved lust is the rebel. Separated from that, if you cast away the transgression, if you cut the cancer out, all shall be well. There is no peace in any other terms. There's no life apart from Christ. The unbelieving world thinks they're alive, but they are walking dead men. It just takes one person. It just takes one decision to see our error, to see our sin like David, and recognize the path of restoration and life in Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we see sinners like us that have fallen. And we see how you have reached out to them. How somehow, some way, you have opened their eyes, just like you open our eyes, causing us to see the error of our ways giving us a desire to want to come back to you, giving us a desire to seek your face, knowing full well that according to your word, you will restore each one. Father, we pray that you would move among us and free us from the distractions that try to take us away from you, the rebel inside of us, the traitor, the things that cause us to go our own way and end up in barrenness and emptiness, because that's where it will lead. Thank you, Lord, for the tree of life. Thank you for Christ. He is our Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.